Wonderful. Lovely. Okay. So we'll do a bit of background on you, Pat, and please feel free to jump in and tell us um, if I'm wrong. Um, so you was at West Bromwich Albion, um, the 2011. Yeah. Is that when you started and you left in 2014? Yeah. Yep. So you started uh, under Roy Hodgson, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you obviously you had players at the club like James Morrison, Graham Dorans, Ben Foster, uh, Chrissy Brunt. Um, famously, one of the biggest probably superstars over the last couple of years, uh, Lukaku as well. Um, <laughs> with his loan spell at the uh, at mm-hmm. the Albion. Um, you've also obviously worked, as we just said, with with Roy Hodgson, Steve Clark, uh, Keith Downing, Dean Coyle, just to name a few. Um, also, people like Peter Adam Wingy, um, Nicholas Anelka. Uh, and Popoff, who's my personal favourite ever chant ever going um, at the Albion, but hey ho. Um, you was also there at the club when the the Albion finished their highest in the Premier League, which was eighth. Um, yeah. That was under Steve Clark as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, and we'll, we'll start off there because that was that was a good season, a good year for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe we beat Liverpool twice. We did the double over <laughs> Liverpool. <laughs> Which which George loves. Um, <laughs> where we had Gira for our um, our first banger of the season on the half volley outside the box in front mm-hmm. of the uh, Smevik end, if I remember correctly. We won 2 0, I think. 3 0. 3 0. We won 3 0 at home. 4 0. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> was it 2 1 or 2 0? Was that Malumbu and Adam Wingy, I believe, was it, if I remember? Uh, Anfield. Is that the right season? I thought it was Chris. Uh, I thought it was um, Romelu Lukaku and Gareth McCauley. You might actually be right. Yeah, you might actually. Be. We've yeah. won a couple of times yeah. at Anfield, so it's hard to keep. <laughs> yeah. up. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start off with there, then and. Um, what you said you've done your homework. <laughs> I, I have. I've just, done it. I've done my homework. Well, just, 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 there's just too many. Um, so currently, at the minute, you're obviously senior kit man for for England, um, yeah. and you've been over in Russia, and obviously, the last couple of uh, last couple of England games. Um, we'll start off on a nice and easy level then. So when, if someone wanted to get into being a kit man, yeah. say someone was coming out of school and they wanted a career in football and they thought about, you know, being a kit man, how does, how does someone come across of being a kit man? How do they go into that career of being a, being a kit man? Um, well, <clears throat> volunteering at a club is easy. is an easy way to start. I was in the right place at the right, right place at the right time. I was, I was, um, delivering I've got a transport business and I delivered some kit to Sweden it was at, just so happens it was for one of the England youth squads um, and it was in 2004 when they didn't really have kitmen as such the goalie coach would do it maybe all of you know one of the other members of staff um, and I was there for a week I was just dropping the kit off and the head coach said to me well if you've got nothing to do why don't you stay and help which is what I did so it went on from there for me I was sort of like in the right place at the right time but there's always opportunities to go in and help at, you know, non-league level and see how it all works to see if, see if you fancy it, you know, at a higher level, what have you. Okay. Well, um, that's, that's, that's good to know. A lot of low-league level clubs will obviously, you know, volunteering will, will be great for that kind of thing and helps them. It's massive for them, I suppose. Yeah. Um, just, just in terms then... of getting a job inside of football... Um, is that like the best thing to do? Is just go and like find your local non-league side, go and offer your hand to like sort of just well, go, I'll help out wherever you need. Or yeah, it hasn't necessarily got to be football, of course, because they have you know there's kit men at rugby, hockey, cricket. Well, bag minute cricket, they have kit men all across the board. You know they have kit men at Formula One. <laughs> you know, so yeah. there's, there's so more just, than just football. Sort of, plenty of opportunities. Yeah, go for it and see what happens. I guess yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just meet the yeah. right people, and you don't you don't really know what'll happen. No, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so as well, going back to that um, that you know wonderful season where we finished eighth. Um, I didn't I don't know if I've mentioned if you know we did the double over Liverpool um, <laughs> that season. Um, we've also um, we we beat the likes of Chelsea as well, didn't we? Obviously, it was the season with the uh, Sir Alex Ferguson's last game, I believe. Was that when was you drew five five. five, five? Yeah. five two, it was five two, was it? And you conceded yeah. three. Yeah, we well, yeah. we brought Big Rom on at half time and uh, he scored a hat trick, didn't he? Um, was you 5 2 up or 5 2 down? No, he was losing. Yeah. He was down. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were. Yeah. Just, just, as, just as that as a whole, we'll touch on that again in a bit later. But what, what was it like around the ground? Sir Alex, last game is at the Albion. It was a 5 5 draw, you know, things that like, doesn't really happen these days, obviously, especially at that level of 5 5. What can you remember what it was like around 
around the club, the buzz? And, and did you speak to Sir Alex? Did, did you say anything to him if you spoke to him? Or uh, I did speak to him, but it was only after the game. But you've got to remember at the time in the build-up for the week, we're trying to finish eighth in the league. So Steve Clark, Keith Downing and Dean Carley are trying to focus on us and not Sir Alex Ferguson and Man United. Yeah. You know, because we needed to win, draw, depending on what I think it was Swansea were doing at home to Liverpool. Yeah, so yeah. We we didn't. Alex Ferguson was never mentioned by Steve Clark in the week building up to the game. You know, we try to concentrate and focus and be as professional as we could to try and get the points or points to do whatever Swansea were going to do, so we could finish eighth. Because finishing eighth in that season was like winning the league for us, because the seven teams above us were all the big hitters, and you know, I think there was maybe. 10 points between 7th and 8th at the time. You know, so we did yeah. like, you know, it was like the mini leagues, wasn't it? The top 7, the next 7, and then the others, and we finished top of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've we've got into that as well with 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 with, uh, with Steve Clark as well. What what was he like as a manager? Was he was he hands on a lot, and was he was he quite calm and collected, or was he really passionate about it and, and got into the lads kind of thing? Because well, he was very passionate as it happens, but he'd also got a couple of good coaching staff with him. He's got Kev Keane, he's got Keith, he's got Dean. Keith would do a lot on the pitch, but Steve yeah. was always taking sessions himself. You know, I got on really well with Steve. He was very very well liked at the club. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of the Albion fans as well was um, was really appreciative of him. I mean, for taking the club after after Roy, because Roy was only there for about a year, wasn't he, before he moved on to uh, yeah. England, obviously. Um, and obviously, Roy did well. He kept us up in the league. Um, and, and someone like Steve, and, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, I knew he was at Chelsea, didn't know, really know much about the fellow, if I'm honest, and, and he obviously come in and, and, and work wonders with, this, with the squad we had. Um, and like you said, to finish eighth in the league, you know, he's, he's really good for a, for a, a yo-yo club as we're branded these days, or people are still branding us uh, as a yo-yo club. Um, what was what was what was the players like? Was was the, what was their mentality like going into? That? I know it's uh, you know quite a few years ago, but what was um, what was it like? The buzz around the training ground was was the lads you know confident and and, and that kind of stuff because we saw it on the pitch as well. Well, he, he, they managed to create a really good team spirit, and I. I I think we're flipping only won three or four games from January to the end of the season. Now I think we had such a good start, yeah. Um, and we kind of like we didn't stumble to eighth because it was an unbelievable achievement, but we didn't win loads of games. And at one point, uh, the new year, people were talking about European football. We were doing that well, and it, team spirit doesn't just happen. You know, it, it has to be created by the players and the staff and the management. And Steve Clark was absolutely brilliant at that. We had a really good pre-season. We went to um, Sweden, if I remember rightly, because it was all booked for Roy to go back to Malmo and stuff like that, because obviously he'd been there before, before he got the England job. Yeah. So it actually started off really well. And I'll never forget his um, team talk in the dressing room at home to Liverpool before the game. It was one of those... It, it won't have affected some of the staff like it affects me, because, you know, I've followed him all my life home and away. So to be involved yeah. in that huddle at the start of the season and then to beat Liverpool 3-0 which was no mean feat by the way it, yeah, was, yeah. it was something special and you just you just knew then we were going to do good things that year and we did I mean I, I remember that West Brom team it had like from an outside I mean I'm, <laughs> I'm a Derby support so I don't really get to watch the Premier League week in week out but that West Brom team sort of defied expectation massively because you look at some of the players in there they just seem like you know, pros. They didn't seem like they had that X factor, but that season, for some reason, everything just sort of clicked. Like, yeah. I think it was, I remember James Morrison scoring some ridiculous volleys and stupid Zoltan Gearer as well. He was ridiculous at striking a ball. Was it just like everything sort of came together, like in a, in a weird way? Yeah, you did, but we had some really good, solid pros, yeah. like you said, you know, good old fashioned footballers, yeah. Jonas Olsen. G Max, Liam Ridgewell, Mozza, Brunty, Ben Foster in goals, Stephen Reed, you know, goes under the radar, but he was fantastic. Stephen Reed, big player, yeah. big player. I remember him being on loan. He was at loan, weren't he, with us the season before, and then we signed him the season yeah. after, didn't we? And I remember when the, the lads come out at the uh, last game of the season, they all, uh, you know, the mic controller called everyone out one by one and they called Stephen Reed out and we all started singing, signing him up, that kind of thing. So he was already, uh, uh, you know, being alone. 
to the club. He was already a fan favourite that season before before signing, and um, it, it, you could always tell that the group of lads they they moulded quite well together. And from an outside looking in, that's what it looked like. And obviously, I'm guessing around the training ground that you know they all become friends. And I suppose some of them already know each other um, through footballers or you know and that kind of thing anyway. But for them, was was there massive friendships? I know you've got like your Brunty and, and your Mozers, you know, who've been at the club a long time, and they've probably built. up a massive friendship with them uh, with each other over the years kind of thing but who who was you know was there was there any clicks together or was all the lads just all in it in it together yeah, kind of thing there aren't many clips clicks at any football uh, grounds to be honest in changing rooms if, if they don't get on you're not going to win anything you know and that's a fact if you haven't got a good team spirit there's no point if you've got a good team spirit you're already one up when you go out there yeah and albion had a bit of everything you know they had sh- to be fair, we had some good football as well, of course. We had a great strike force, so that helped. You know, we got Romelu, Shane Long, Odom Wingy, Michael. Shane Long's um, massively underrated. Yeah. Yeah. Shane Long was yeah. a bit of a bagsman, Monty, at, at times. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. He he scored that that goal against the Villa when he when he brought it down. The unreal touch before before smashing it into the net. Um, was you was you there when that was you there? Was that one of the times when you was at the Albion? Do you remember that? Yeah, when it was. He, we were, he comes we over the top up, of him. Doors. Yeah. Yeah. He hit unreal, yeah. and his pace as well was 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 terrifying as as well as um, like, like with with Big Rom like for, for, the, for the age and the size of him and he could move his mobility was 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 top notch to us. Yeah, he was for, for for how young um, for how young he was. How old was he? Like 17, 18 at the time, something around that that age was he? Pat, I think. Longy. Uh, Rom, Big Rom. Oh no, yeah, he was, and he could hold court by the way <laughs> in the dressing room. I think he was 19 when he signed for us. Wasn't 19, he? yeah. yeah. He, he he was. He, we I just knew watching him um, that season, knowing that th- this guy is going to be something special. Yeah, if yeah. we could, we need to sign this bloke um, because we could easily triple our money if, if you know if ever like, needed like to be Everton, a bit like, like what, Everton, yeah. Everton did. Yeah, a bit like Everton. I mean, we've we've that as well. Talking about the run because obviously um, the next season uh, going into the transfer window, there was a massive rumor going around that. He was on, you know, very close to coming back to the Albion. A lot of people obviously got excited. And um, how, how close was Rom to coming back to the Albion? Yeah, about two miles, I think. He was on the really, M6. yeah, he was on the M6, um, and he literally was about to get off at the training ground. I think we were paying two million quid for a loan season, and Everton came in after they sold Fellaini, I believe, that day. Yeah, yeah. I think they day, offered yeah. five million. It was when Moyes went Brilliant. to Manchester United, wasn't it? He signed for Lelaney on deadline day. Yeah. 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 That yeah was no, he, he was on his way. Don't worry about that. He was coming. Yeah. I remember the buzz. The buzz <laughs> going around, yeah. Well, with that, with that as well, because, uh, again... I think my, my memory is a little bit as I'm getting older it's it's fading a little bit but um, that was that the season where we signed Anichabi as well as, it, was that, it was that night I think it was that night wasn't it was he Anichabi and was, Stefan Sessigny on the same night was he ever if, if we would have signed Rom on that loan the two lads Sessigny on and Big Vic was they always going to join the club as well or was that probably a plan B in case something fell through with, with Big Rom uh, I, do you know what I don't know the answer to that they we, we were we were signing them permanently and we were only signing Roman alone, so possibly I possibly. genuinely don't know the answer to that. But both of them were in the dressing, uh, the training ground, because I was trying to print Sessignon's sh- shirt because he wanted the, you know, the photo shoot. Yeah. You tried printing Sessignon's shirt when first of all you don't know how to spell it. And secondly, <laughs> and secondly, you haven't got a name block, so you've got to use individual letters. And he stood over your shoulder, and he's got a flight to catch back up to the northeast. There's a bit of pressure that night, actually. <laughs> Okay. So what? So for you guys as well, being around the training ground on uh, transfer deadline day, obviously hey, well, you I guys put in and just say what a player, by the way. Sessignon. Yeah, mate. Yeah, Sessignon. Yeah, underrated, massively underrated. Great, great. His, his technical ability was a joke. Yeah, his low sense of gravity on, on the ball for, for such a small for such a small fellow. He, you know how he could he could sprint up and down, and he weren't he weren't scared of a tackle either with Sessignon. He weren't he weren't. I don't think he was that scared to get stuck was in it, like you seen. Was it you signing you know? from Sunderland or Sunderland? Yeah. Signing from you, I'd I mean, say which yeah. way is a bit of a blur now. We signed him from Sunderland. Yeah. yeah. Top player. Um, Sorry, mates. <laughs> I can't remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> oh yeah, around the training ground with um, transfer deadline. Day. What what's the feel around a club? It, can you feel like the the pressure in the air kind of thing? And because obviously the, the lads who do everything and you know the financial side and stuff like that, they obviously must see 
the um you know the social medias and that kind of thing and you know the newspapers and, and the online stuff going around do they do they feel the pressure of we need to get stuff over the line and does that pass on to like the staff wars like yourselves and uh, and that kind of thing um, no, it's, it, it kind of affects the kit department because ideally they're going to want shirts printed up for photo shoots and stuff yeah. like that. I was there for the uh, Keith Andrews and I think we signed Liam Ridgewell on one night in the same evening. Yeah. Um, and I was there for the Claudio Jacob one. The Claudio Jacob one was jun- done during the day, if I remember rightly. I think it might have been in, on international break when he was a bit quieter. Um but the, the ones that are done in the evening, there's only probably the club secretary there, maybe the solicitor, play liaison officer, and maybe the chairman. Everyone else has gone home. Obviously, it's six, seven o'clock at night. I'm not saying the kit man would always stay, but because I was a fan, I was definitely always going to yeah. stay because I wanted to see what was happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember going up to the to the ground a couple of years ago with um, with a family member and his two young sons. Uh, he had two twins. He had twins, two kids, and um, he said, "Do you might do you want the lads want to go up to the training ground? It's transfer deadline day. Do you want to, do you want to come up?" And I was like, "Yeah, I've got nothing better to do." So, you know, I finished work early. We'll go up and we we sat outside the training. We drove into the training ground uh, and parked behind the Sky News van, and. Um, a bloke come out, the security bloke said, you know, what are you here for? It was like, oh, the lad's just what he was like, you've got to move up to the green gate. So we went back and this silver uh, Peugeot pulled up in front of the gate. So I didn't have a clue. And, and my uh, wife's uh, uh, cousin never had a clue either. And the two lads in the back went, oh, that's Alan Nom. He's signing for the Albion. I never even heard of the bloke. I knew he was from Watford, never knew nothing about him. Um, and, uh, and that was the, the year we signed uh, signed Alan, Alan Nom. Um, but going into transfer deadline day as well, I always remember a time watching mm. sports and there was, I can't remember if it was a, a guy or a girl who stood there, was, was it fish and chips or sausage and chips or something? And you'd, yeah, it was you and that had yeah. buying, buying or up the Albion or something on it. What, yeah. what was the story behind that? Well, I, it was, it was a deadline day that um, Romilly was supposed to be coming. And I, cause I knew I was saying I'd gone up to, you know, the fish and chip shop just up the road from the training ground. Training ground. Yeah. Um, and I went to get myself sausage and chips, but I bought 10 sausage and chips because there was about eight blokes there from Sky. And I just gave them to him as I came in. And he, I wrote boing boing on it. So I said, look, I, there might be something happening. So here's fish and chips for you, you know. And I think he used it on Sky, didn't he? He did, he did, he did. I remember, I remember sitting there and watching him talk and he, he held it up to the camera and it just said boing boing on the, uh, on the wrapper kind of thing. And um, I, I, don't, I can't remember, I think it was obviously yourself afterwards. I think it was on Twitter. I mean, again, like my memory's faded, um, but I'm sure you popped it up there. That's why, that's why I wanted to, to ask you about it because it was like a cheeky little kind of message to the, to the world that, you know, boing boing up the bag is kind of thing and ruffle a few feathers. Well, by the way. 25 quid. <laughs> I hope you put it on expenses. <laughs> I, I want to, talking of boing boing, did you um, write on a match day ball and nearly lose your job because of it? I did, funnily enough, yeah. <laughs> What's it, the story behind that one? <laughs> it, wasn't the, it, was, it wasn't the boing boing I nearly got sacked for. It was, I pushed it, I did it twice actually, and I wrote boing boing on it once. Um, and then I wrote, we were singing a song at the time, We Know What We Are, as in Pride of the Midlands. I wrote, we know what we are on the second time. Um, and I made the mistake of telling the bloke who was filming as the players come out of the tunnel, where the ball's on the little podium thing. I made the mistake of telling the bloke who was filming to make sure he got it on TV <laughs> as they come out. And his worst to me was, oh, don't worry, I'm going to do that. And straight away, I thought, I'm going to get into trouble for this. And within 30 seconds of kickoff, I had a tap on the shoulder, sat on the bench, and the press officer says, have you written something on the ball? And I went, I might have done. And then <laughs> I, was, I got called into the office on the Monday. And I think it even made the flipping Sun newspaper with the headline, Baggy Balls Up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank did, you, did, the, did, chair, the chairman and the chief exec. Didn't see the funny side of it, but just said, look, we can't be doing that, you know. Yeah. So you, you, you act, did you actually get really seriously in trouble with they like, you know, this this is your last, your first and last strike. Anything like this again? And no, it wasn't, no, it wasn't as serious as that. Nothing like that. No, just a bit of a slap on the wrist. Yeah, yeah, what you're doing, you idiot. You know. <laughs> did they actually? Did the ball actually get used in the game? 
Yeah, it was a match ball. It was the actual way. I thought it was, yeah, so it actually got used. <laughs> that's, that, that's brilliant. Did, that's you, brilliant. did you get to keep the ball? That's a, another question I need to ask. Did no, you I didn't. It? And you oh. know what? Over the next few weeks, at uh, one point where we're taking a corner, the camera's homed in on the ball and you can see boing, boing on it. And then for the next few weeks, Sky have used that picture as, as in, if we're on TV <laughs> over the next few weeks, they've used this picture of the ball. So, you know. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. That's absolutely that's brilliant, brilliant, that is. Um, talking with, uh, say, chairmen and, and the ones above as well, uh, with uh, with Jeremy Pierce, what what was he like as a as an owner slash chairman? What was he? Uh, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask you the question. Yeah. Did he actually give uh, a toss about the club, or was it just literally a financial? It was a business to him. Obviously, with the Premier League, it was uh, everyone knows that you know clubs are there to make money and. and Everything else is 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 an add-on, is a plus kind of thing. But what was it? I, I met him the once at Reading away, um, in in the cup game, and I bumped into him, and he spoke to me for about five minutes, and I thought he was a quite genuine, quite a nice guy, um, who who cared about the club. Where a lot of fans, including me until that point, believe that it, obviously it was just a business. But what was he like around around the club and and that kind of thing? And, and is he an Albion fan? Well, hundred percent, he's an Albion fan. Make no mistake about that. Yeah, he's definitely an Albion fan. Was he a good owner? Listen, although you know, I can't say anything bad about the bloke because you can speak as you find. And yeah, you know, I think he, it's a business, isn't it? It's, it's always a business. It's always about making money. And he's no different any football anybody club. else. Any any football club. Yeah, I mean, he's, related, he's relating it to Derby's current situation with our owner is one of the biggest <laughs> Derby fans you can think of. But at the end of the day, he's got a business to run and as much as fans can turn around and go, what's he making that decision for if he's a Derby fan? At the end of the day, it's it's ruthless, isn't it? It's, it's he's he's got a balance of books. Yeah. He's, you know, yeah. We're, he, we're a working man's club. We haven't got a flipping 50 million quid to spend yeah. on players. Exactly. That's a fact, yeah. you know, simple as that. Was like he, 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 may, he may well have been. He, he ran a tight ship. I did a removal for him once. <laughs> he, um, he was moving some stuff out of a house in London. Yeah, and he won't, I'd, he's never going to hear this story anyway, but he won't mind me telling it. Um, and he's, I'd quoted him 500 quid exactly, but 10 quid for the congestion charge, so 510 quid. 10 pound, yeah. And when we got down there, we'd finished removal, he handed over me 500 pound. Bear in mind, we'd be sweating our knackers off for five hours because he, he got a big house. He gave me 500 quid, he said. I knocked ten pound off because you don't have to pay the congestion charge on a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> You're joking. The guy didn't know as it happened, so he gave me five hundred instead of five hundred and ten. Wow, that's a business. <laughs> that's, well. that's a business. That, yeah, that's that's yeah. that's a business, but that's one rule one hundred and one, I suppose, isn't it? Don't don't pay too. What you don't have to pay kind of thing. Yeah, well. exactly. He might have got fish and, and chips I, on the way home. You <laughs> put that. Into into the club as well, with obviously with the baggies and and obviously um, that the whole storm around uh, Sido and that potential move to Tottenham and, and that kind of thing. So, um, I was, like I say, I had five minutes of the bloke. I thought he was quite a genuine, quite a nice guy, and and actually, you know, cared about the Albion. And uh, I think I think we lost to Reading. I think it might have been the quarters of the FA Cup or something or something like that. And we lost. It might have been. It wasn't the semis. It might have been the quarters. Uh, it could have been the semis. I don't know. Um, but he seemed like a, 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 a nice replay. guy. You what? Sorry. I think it was the fifth round in a replay. Fifth round, yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, and and, I, and I, th- I thought he was genuinely quite a nice, quite a nice guy. Uh, he, he had five minutes to talk to me. Uh, we were just passing each other in the, in the corridor, kind of thing. And I was like, "Oh, you're Jeremy." And he's like, "Oh, you know." <laughs> and we spoke, and he seemed like a quite, quite a nice guy. So, um, with with Roy Hodgson. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of the Albion fans call him Uncle Roy. Um, I, you know, really appreciated Roy at the club. I thought he was a really good manager. He got the team playing, um, attractive football. Um, what was what was the impact he had? I don't. And obviously, I know you was uh, it was your first year with the Baggies. Obviously, you're a massive Albion fan anyway. So, what was what was what was it like around around the ground and the club with with uh, with Roy Hodgson? Well, I, I was fortunate enough to be at Albion for two seasons where they finished eighth and nine. I never had the hassle of relegation and stuff like that. So we were in a position where we were probably safe in February and March. So the lads are getting more days off. They're not training every day, you know, because don't forget the time our aim is to stay in the Premier League and that was it. 
Yeah. And he had an unbelievable effect on um, the club. No two ways about that. And he was a tough act to follow for Steve, you know, which yeah. some fans don't ever... I'm sure, you know, oh, Steve Clark did this, Steve Clark... Steve Clark did an unbelievable job following Roy to keep things going. I think Roy Hodgson's a little bit underrated as a manager. I mean, I know Jordan probably isn't. Hey, oh, the meeting has been upgraded by the host. Oh, cool. All right. <laughs> Sorry. The uh, What's it? Um, Roy Hodgson gets a bit of a bad rep because of his time with Liverpool because obviously it was like the, the transition of Liverpool where they, they sort of didn't have the big names and the pool power at that time. But his track record across most of his clubs is fantastic. I mean, he's doing a good job at Palace now and he's he's did a good job at West Brom. He he sort of was a bit unlucky with the England job as well, with the sort of timing of it, following the golden generation sort of thing. So I, I think he's massively underappreciated as a manager as well. And he's one of the English managers who actually went abroad and, and did a bit of a business as well. So well, he spent most of his yeah. time abroad, didn't he? Yeah. He was Switzerland manager. Won the league at uh, one of the really small clubs in Sweden. You know, he was really popular with the lads as well. Yeah, I think I think a lot of Albion fans don't really have a, anything bad to say about about Roy. I think we all. Um, I remember it was, it was Bolton, wasn't it? Last a game of the season yeah, away, yeah. I think it was, and um, uh, you know, we all we all said our good boys and, and give him, a, you know, wished him well because we. All, I think everyone really did appreciate him at the club and. Um, it just showed again what the the club was trying to achieve in in the Premier League and, and what they were trying to to bring in and obviously again players like Anelka I mean I know that didn't work out well but to bring someone like Nicholas with that stardom and that fame around him a, a big French footballer obviously did extremely well at, at Chelsea and, and 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 Man City and that kind of thing so the pull in was 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 great and we still get it to these days now where we get the with the big names mentioned and um and that kind of thing so uh i think a lot of albi fans appreciated roy a, a lot for, for what he did at the club and um yeah like you say with steve clark he had he had big boots to fill and I, I think he filled them quite well to be fair yeah it wasn't roy who bought nicholas of course it was steve clark yeah it was steve yeah yeah, yeah. um with the um now i remember as well again was uh, I think it was a video the club might have put up a couple of years ago, years and years ago. You had at the training ground uh, a load of uh, international kits hanging up on the wall. What's the what's the story behind behind the international kits? Well, I uh, Chris Brunt had been abroad with one of uh, they got a match and he just bought me one of his shirts back. You know, I love Chris Brunt. I was a chairman of the Chris Brunt fan club and I still am. You know. <laughs> And he yeah. bought me one of his the shirt back from that game. I, I'm not going to lie, I can't remember who it's against. And I said, do you mind if I hang this up in the... Um, I got a print room, which is what the lads had to go through to get in the dressing room. He said, no, carry on, hang it up. So I hung it up and then um, Moza bought one in, Dozer bought one in, and they all started bringing him. Even Steve <laughs> Clark bought one in. You know, it was one of those. And eventually, yeah. we almost had one for every player. Um, and Craig Dawson, who was in the England under-21s at the time, he actually bought one in, but he hadn't got his name on. He just got a number on. So the lads took it off. They wouldn't let him pick it up. So, <laughs> you're not putting under 21 shirts in here. It's got to be seniors, you know. So, is it is it like that around the club with with like the recognition of talent sort of thing? Because I know with my brief spells of going into Derby's training ground, they've got a lot of you no know, like past players like Will Hughes and Jeff Hendrick, sort of academy graduate shirts on the wall, sort of painting the picture for the next generation as such is is it like one of them sort of things where it's me setting this like the theme really like breeding the well, it, success it definitely was when i was there I, obviously it's been a few years since i worked at the club but in my day around the area where the youth team got changed i can definitely remember things like pictures of jack rose who was yeah. a keeper who played for england 16s they'd have that jonathan leco played for the under 16s england they'd have those pictures of them stood up with the national anthem being lined up. Yeah. And yeah. around the similar, first time. Similar first sort of team, setup, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the first team area, we got pictures of um, goals and celebrations and stuff like that hanging up on the walls. But they were always being updated season by season. They never they stood up they never stayed there for a long time. They always rotated Updated, and yeah. changed them around. So it doesn't go stale. It's like a project of a movie yeah, yeah. like a timeline, I suppose. Yeah. Um from from when you was at West Brom, um, is there any players or people you still stay in contact with now uh well i'm still in touch with peter i still dropped chris brunt the odd message here and there i went and did something with the foundation and boaz was there 
I yeah. saw Mazza the other week at Lillyshull because he's now involved with the under 23s. So yeah, I went of course, yeah. Albion under 23s against Wolves under 23s. Um, yeah. So, other than that, there's actually no one now left at the club, player wise, that was when there was when there. I was there. Not a soul, they've all gone. Just, just an interesting one. Do you ever still get in touch with Romelu Lukaku? Uh, do you know what? I saw him. Um, we, pl- I was at the World Cup in Russia and we played Belgium, didn't we? Yep. Yes. Yeah. And that was the first time I saw him since the day he left and the day he was supposed to come to Albion. And to be fair, I hugged him and I whispered in his ear, I said, I still haven't forgiven you. <laughs> he knew exactly what I meant. <laughs> he, was, you I know, he was coming that night. Yeah. He was definitely on his way. It's just one of those things. I read that. Fair enough. And are you still his favourite kit man? He's <laughs> <laughs> already crossed one line. <laughs> I, I, I remember going to uh, going to um, a players meet at the at the club um, a, a couple of years back, and I put it on Twitter. And Pat messaged me and said, "Ask Chris Brunt who his favourite kit man is." So we went up to have some photos, and I was having a quick natter with Chris. I went, "I've been asked to ask you who who's the uh, your favourite kit man," and he went, "As Pat asked you, asked you to ask me that," and I went, "Yeah," and he went, he went "It's not Pat." <laughs> I was like, oh, "Right, okay, cool." Um, but yeah, yeah, like Chrissy Brunt, Chrissy, Chrissy and James Morris are, are my favourite two Albion fans from from my generation. Um, Albion fans, Albion, Albion players, sorry, from my generation. Um, I think two massive role models for young kids uh, coming up into into the game from that era, anyway. And obviously, Chris has moved on now to Bristol. And obviously, we we hope if it maybe it hurts me to see him in a different shirt, but you know we hope he has a, a good couple of years there. Or, or if he's retiring next year, we wish him well. And obviously, Mazza with the under twenty uh, threes, is it? Yeah, under twenty threes. Hopefully, you know it, he'll progress and and be a bit like um, you know Darren Moore, and maybe one day he might get a shot at you know at being the Albion manager. What would as as obviously you've known them as well at quite a long time. Could you see Chrissy going into management as well as obviously taking the same step as what James is doing? Absolutely, yeah. I'm sure he'll start. He he wanted to play another season or two, Chris, to be fair. Yeah. Mozart, I think, was ready to start going into the coaching mm-hmm. business. I'll be amazed if we don't see Brunty back at our club as some kind of coach with a youth setup. I'd say, from, yeah. from the I mean, outside with Chris Brun, he just seems like he is the leader. Like, he is, he All just, yeah. he is Mr. West Brom for me. Like, when you think of West Brom, you think mm-hmm. Chris Brun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And make no mistake, if, if we don't snap him up, somebody else will. Yeah. yeah. 100%. I mean, he's left foot as well. Yeah. I mean, the kid, the kid was amazing. Like we, that, that, when, it, when he's early stages at the Albion as well, we've, the way he used to whiz the ball in the box with pace and accuracy was, was second to none. He, you know, the way he just fling the ball in and to the box and, you know, you get someone, someone on the end of it. And it was easy goals for the kid. And, we, you know, Sheffield Wednesday. Thanks <laughs> for, for sending him to us because, yeah. you know, he turned out to be to be well worth the money. And obviously, like you mm. say, Mister West Brom. I don't, I don't think, yeah. um, I don't think anyone can say anything bad about it. I know, I know. There's yeah, a couple he of things. He got his move to Albion after we played Sheffield Wednesday. Yes, they beat, yeah. they beat us midweek one night there, and I think he slaughtered Martin Albrickson, and we signed him not long after that. <laughs> yeah. What what a lad! What a lad! And obviously with uh, with James Morrison as well, who hopefully um, he, you know he's agreed to come on the show, so he's our second guest, which is which is big for us because, like I say, especially for me because he's one of my, my idols of, of the Albion. Um, could you see him obviously taking the round at the at the dugout at the Albion? Well, he's he's, he's not far away from it now, is he? He's his assistant at the under twenty threes with Dion Burton, I think. So, you yeah. know, he's obviously got his um, career path sorted. I think. Um, wicked, and then um, with your um, obviously being being you know the Albion kit man, and we'll move on to England shortly. Um, what's the what is the best ground you visited as as a you know West going Brom. to uh, yeah with West Brom? Yeah. Um, and why and, and what ground? What ground well, and why? Uh, Wigan was definitely up there, and Swansea because their dressing rooms are built for rugby teams. Yeah, so they're big. Yeah, yeah. yeah so they're massive. And if you go to places like Newcastle, for instance. Um, Fulham, they're, they're tiny little places. I don't like to moan about Fulham because it's quite a little host- historic place there, a little cottage yeah. where you get changing. Yeah, but there's no room to put anything anywhere. It's the same as Newcastle, you wouldn't believe how small the away dressing room is. It's quite surprising. So, if you push Newcastle, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you wouldn't think massive. it, would you? Yeah, so I would say my all time favorite away dressing room is Wigan. 
we get just, no, just on the small worm. Uh, uh, sorry, me. Uh, just on the with the on the uh, small away chain rooms. Do you think they kind of do it to like I was thinking, unsettle yeah, the other I was team? Thinking that as well, yeah. Uh, well, no space. You're kind of banging around in, into yeah. each other and trapped yeah, in. We, do you think they do it to unsettle? Well, I was at Norwich once, and you know that have they had tours with fans coming through the ground? Yeah. So, because I, I like to set up nice and early, um, the blokes um, knocked on the dressing room door and said, "Look, we've got a tour coming." Can you can we leave the door open so they look in? I said, Oh, you can bring them in. As long as they don't touch anything, you can bring them in. I, you know, we I've got the squad numbers, the shirts are all turned around, no one knows who's playing. I wasn't giving anything away. And this tour guide goes on all this spiel. You know, we've got concrete benches, we give them cold showers, we make sure there's no electric and all this. And as he's about to leave, I went, Can I bear in mind he's got 30 Norwich fans with him? I said, um, just on that, by the way, folks. I said, that's why we'll beat you today. I said, because this sort of stuff. <laughs> They think it has, they think it works. I said, it doesn't. It just winds us up and makes us want to beat you even more. <laughs> and as it happened, we did beat them 1 0. And I so wish they'd come back in the dressing room afterwards. It, it is. So it does, obviously, a lot of grounds. And, and, and I know the bigger clubs these days, you know, met the. Um, met the changing rooms, the way changing rooms are a bit more comfortable. But so the actual, you know, the basic of the, the wooden benches, the cold showers, it actually motivates the lad to go out and go, we need to smash these today because they put us in that room with a cold shower. Yeah. We need to go out there and, 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 and you know, no turn them over. Oh, it's the other way, it's the other, it's the other end of the spectrum at uh, Arsenal. It is luxurious, their dressing room, you know, for the visitors. But they've yeah. got this massive unit right in the middle of the dressing room. <laughs> so, if, if everyone's sitting down, you can't see. Chris Brunty sat opposite James Morrison. He can't see him. No one can see him because there's this massive wooden unit in the middle. So no one can sit down and speak. Everyone's got to stand up. So you look at like the the sort of newer dressing rooms, the Man Cities. I know I've seen that quite heavily. Tottenham's. They're all Tottenham's. quite spa- like massively spacious. Is it like that in the other end, or is it sort of a bit dumbed down? Like like you said with Arsenal, is it? Did he do little things like that now? Because obviously, I think there's going to be some sort of you've got to give them this and that. It's how it should be, really. Yeah. A lot of the away dressing rooms they're, they're obviously improving as the new stadiums go up and stuff like that. In fact, the new dressing rooms at Wembley, I haven't used them yet, but they've been built basically to NFL spec, if you yeah, know what I mean. The massive, big, yeah. massive arch and what have you. So I'm looking forward to doing that one in a couple of weeks. And I think Tottenham's new ones like that, yeah, Leicester's. Spurs. I did a game the other week at Leicester for England, the other month at Leicester, and theirs is like that. They're definitely improving. But some of them, you know, when you get Yeovil away in the cup, <laughs> like we did once, you know, when you go to places like that, there's a bit of an eye-opener. How does how do you go about setting up for somewhere like Yeovil? Obviously, with like somewhere like the Emirates, you've got the, the luxuries of being inside, probably, you know, a massive space and that kind of thing. With Yeovil, how, how does your setting up, is, is it any different to setting up at Tottenham, Arsenal, yeah. Chelsea. No, you just have to be. Um, you just have to try and work things out best you can. Sometimes there's not enough space to hang up twenty three shirts, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I, I actually really enjoy going to places like Yeovil because as a kit man, and you see what the kit man's like at Yeovil. I, I don't know if it's the same lad now, but when you're in the Premier League and you're a kit man, you've got access to phone calls, to Adidas for boots, Puma for kit. You can have everything delivered next day. This kid at Yeovil. It was about 18. He hadn't even got enough warm-up T-shirts for the lads to warm up in. He's got a washer and dryer smaller than the ones I've got in my house. The 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 blokes down the lower echelons of the league, these are the decent kit men, by the way. You know, yeah. you can be a kit man in the Premier League and have all the luxuries in the world. You, st- I st- you still learn off these kids down on the lower end with the smaller clubs and the smaller kit allocations and the space they've got, you know, it's it's a tough gig down the lower end. I sometimes see it when, like, FA Cup day and it's, you know, Sutton United, I think, a, f- a few years ago when they... Who did they draw in the cup? I can't... Was it, Ar- was it Arsenal? Arsenal? Arsenal. Arsenal. And, like, they were showing you the dressing rooms of what, Ar- like, the Arsenal players were, were getting changed in. And it must be a bit of an eye-opener for, for professionals as well who were sort of looked after. They get the, the glamorous stuff. Going to these places where... You know, it's at their comfort zone as such. And you do see it in the FA Cup. And I personally think that's sometimes why you see these giant killings because they go there and they're not comfortable. They just. Just on yeah. sales teams. You won't remember this because you're not as old as me, but I'm sure about 20 years ago, West Ham uh, played Rotherham away. And I don't know if they won or lost. I can't remember in the Cup. 
and they actually moaned about the size of the dressing room. You know, mm. I think I think but it may have happened game, in the week the with, with Tottenham as well going to Bulgaria. I think that may have been a factor with them over there as well because obviously the facilities for uh, was it Plop. Plovdiv, locomotive Plovdiv. Yeah, Plovdiv, I think yeah. I think they may have got to some of their luxury players as well. These sort of players who were thinking they've made it, and you know they're playing for Tottenham Hotspur. And you... I was going to say that. Like, I imagine for the the smaller teams like West Brom for themselves going to a big ground like say a Liverpool and Arsenal, and they've got a smaller changing room. Obviously not so much now, but if they try to unsettle them with changing rooms, it'd put a bit more yeah. firepower in. But if it was like a Arsenal going to Liverpool or whatever, the superstars so much in the teams are like get a bit unsettled because they're used to being looked after and glamorous. And I imagine it's more for the bigger teams it'd upset. Whereas like you say for yourself, if it happened to West Brom, they're up there, they're they're raw, they want to go and batter them, kind of thing. Yeah, but also don't forget um, Harry Kane, for instance. He's been on loan at lower league clubs. Hasn't yeah, he? yeah, yeah. He'll know exactly how it works. You know, he, yeah. Um, you'd be surprised. The big hitters, they, they don't, they don't moan about it. The players, they've all been there. You know, they've all yeah. started somewhere, haven't they? They know, yes, how it of works. course, of course, yeah. So before we um, before we move on to England, then, and obviously what you're currently doing now and that and that kind of stuff. Just run us through what is, uh, the day to day of a kit man. What you know, so the build up to the game. What what you have to do with the obviously away going away as well. Like um, I'm guessing you guys got there a day before and, and and get all the dressing room set up ready. So on the day you haven't got to really do that much um, prep, shall we say? So just run us through your day to day of what you do as as being a kit man. Well, I'm sure most kit men are the same. They normally go the day before. The the team would normally train on a Friday if they're playing on a Saturday, and then. Uh, two at half, one, two o'clock. If we were playing in London, for instance, we would leave the training ground one, two o'clock, get down there for dinner, have an evening meal. I would always go to the dressing room to set up if I could, mainly because, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, how good you are. Everybody forgets things. Mistakes happen. You've, you know, you've seen it. Kitman have yeah. forgot whole kits in the past. Yeah. It does happen. So I, like, I used to... Like... Is it that the big one, Manchester United, when they played Southampton? And they had to play in... They had, the, they had, to, they had their own yeah, kit, didn't they? they? And they should have had their away kit, yeah. And they ended up playing in Southampton's away kit, didn't they, or something? Away yeah. kit. I thought, yeah. That, yeah, there was a kit class, yeah. wasn't there, that's yeah. all. Yeah, they got yeah, their own yeah. kit instead of their away kit. And, yeah, I don't yeah. think you forgot anything, to be fair to him. I am sticking up for the kit man here. I don't think you forgot anything. There was just a bit of a kit class, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, we didn't the forget anything. Yeah. Yeah. lives on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so we would always set up the night before for that reason, to make sure nothing was forgotten. We'd make sure everything was set up, other than maybe the match shirts, you know. And then I would still go back down on the Saturday uh, just to make sure everything was all right and, you know, take in the atmosphere and wait for the players and staff to arrive. What do what do the players do on a... So if they're kicking off on a Saturday at three o'clock, yeah. what's what's their routine? Do they, do, they, do they try and before they go, obviously, and play 90 minutes to do any gym work or nothing, or is it just literally low-key, rest, eat, fuel yourself, and then get they ready They might the do something. I think Albion... Once we were playing Swansea in an evening kickoff, and I think we did something one morning just to walk through, you know, nothing, no training, no one's doing any running, just they'll do set plays or something like that. For instance, with England the other week in Iceland, we kicked off at five o'clock. We didn't do anything in the morning. I think in Denmark, we kicked off at quarter to eight, but we did something on the day of the game just to break up the day, really. But if it's a three o'clock kickoff, they'll try and sleep in as long as possible till maybe 10 to have some breakfast and then have a pre-match meal. Uh, the, and there's a f- famous quote from uh, Wayne Rooney um, about early kickoffs, 12 o'clock kickoffs. And he, he moaned about eating pasta at like nine o'clock in the morning. Is that, is that kind of what they eat on an early kickoff or is it literally, is it breakfast or is it something like, you know, your carbs, like your, your pastas well, and they, stuff? They'd have options. They wouldn't just have pasta, obviously. I was going to say, I've seen an interesting interesting story about Robbie Keane who uh, he said he never he never had breakfast for on a match day if yeah. it was a three o'clock kickoff he wouldn't eat before the game yeah so people have their own little rituals yeah. some will eat some won't you know that, Paul yeah. Sean yeah. he brings his own food so that leads to another question oh really like, how awkward is it to deal with somebody who's got awkward superstitions like there's, there's some weird superstitions with people like they have to have the left boot in a certain place or some stupid stuff like that it's well, you say you say stupid stuff, but you know when these but people yeah, have it's, superstitions. It's like silly for us, but for them, it, it's everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, Carl Walker has got lucky pants, and you know people <laughs> laugh about it. Yeah, it's, but it's, when wasn't he that in the documentary, the, the all or nothing one? I think I've seen a bit of the Kitman talked about it in in the documentary. 
Well, there yeah. you go. He's had these looking pants because that he hasn't been at Tottenham for a while, has he? And when they give them <laughs> yeah. to you at the end of the game, say, look after these, but can you make sure you wash them for the next game? You know, these little pants, so you got to try and look after them for four days. <laughs> I was sleeping with them under my pillow to make sure I didn't lose. <laughs> we, was, was there something, I don't know what this has just popped into bed as well. Was there something about Stephen Reid and his shin pads? Yeah. Was that his lucky lucky kind of charm or, or whatnot? No, he, he's, had these, he's had these shin pads for years and years and years. And unbelievably, I set up on a Friday night at Albion. And I, my, I think my daughter came with me just to help. And she said, oh, can I put the shin pads out? And I went, yeah, okay, you can put the shin pads out. And she's put Stephen Reed in somebody else's peg. And, of course, when I've come to check yeah. before I leave, there's no Stephen Reed shin pads. And I, I may even have rung him. I said, Stephen, I've flipping lost your shin pads. But my daughter had put them in a little peg about four seats down, so we actually found them. <laughs> so, yeah, he'd had his, you know, shin pads, they don't, they'd like to use the same ones. Some of them got their children's pictures on, their wives' pictures on, you know. Yeah. Oh, wicked. Um, and we'll finish off then. Predictions this season. Uh, for West Brom, touchy subject at the moment, I think it very is touchy. I'm still hurting. If we were playing Barcelona away tonight, I'd say we were going to win, but <laughs> realistically, they're, they're going to have to sign a couple of people to have a chance of stopping up. I agree. Yeah, and again, as well, what we took that, how, how, we obviously, we, um, the fans, um, can't go to the grounds at the minute. Hopefully, soon that will change, they'll start letting. Obviously, I know they've done it a bit over the weekend, um, and with the with the empty stadium, what is it like uh, being involved in a match where there's literally no one there apart from obviously your team, their team, and, and a few of the uh, the club's officials and that kind of thing? What is do, are the players actually struggling? Because I know a lot of teams like ourselves, the fans we give them a boost and, and they run at 110 instead of you know 100. Um, are, are the fans actually? I mean, are the players actually struggling that much with with fans being there or with fans without being there, or or are they not that really? First boy. Are, are they struggling? Possibly not, but you could ask you could ask a thousand footballers, would they rather have the fans there? And every one of them is going to say yes, they would. Yep. And yeah. it, the first time I, I experienced no fans was when England played Croatia last year. When, yeah, they had to they play behind, behind closed, closed doors. Closed doors. Yeah. And you actually hear every single word that's said on the pitch. And I mean every single Wasn't word. Wasn't there a funny story from it, that game of the fans on the hill? Yeah, yeah, yeah there was yeah. about 30 fans and you could hear them singing. Yeah, I've yeah. seen something on the internet yeah. like that, yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's it's not so much. I think that the footballers would struggle. I think it's they, they'd struggle finding that extra step that yeah. the fans giving me. If, if they if they concede a goal, where like for me with Liverpool playing in Anfield, we've always got a twelfth man with the, the Anfield. Like that's why when Barca came, we beat them four 0 kind of thing. We give them that extra lift. I think it's yeah, yeah. it's not so much they struggle from the start. It's when they concede a goal and the fans get behind them and lift them back up again. Or like they said, when you 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 you're behind, you you score a goal to draw and then you go for the winner. I think that's maybe that's what they'd struggle with a little bit more rather than struggling from the beginning. Kind of yeah, the, the players want the fans back as much as the fans no, want to get back. I was yeah. speaking to Mr. Holmes, Dwayne at Derby, and he, um, we asked him, I think it was two or three games after lockdown, like after we returned, and he says like he's one of them players that when he starts cramping up in like the 70-odd minute, he, he tries to listen for the fans to, to sort of will him and, and get through the rest of the game, and it it sort of puts it all in perspective when you hear it. Like, fans do make a massive difference. I mean, Sheffield United last season probably missed out on Europe because the fans weren't there. And they won games yeah, yeah. single-handedly at Bramall Lane because the atmosphere is unbelievable. And I think yeah. some teams, I mean, again, would West Brom be doing better when the fans are there? Quite possibly. Because it is yeah. an extra man. Like, when, when you score a goal, it, it lifts everybody. Yeah, absolutely it does, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll move on to England. Obviously, what yep. you're doing now. Um, we, we've, we've obviously we've got to start with with Russia. Um, I think literally everyone and his dog believed it was coming home um, <laughs> that year. I think I think I know whenever England go into into a tournament and like rightly so with 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 next year with the Euros, we'll all we'll all believe it's coming home until the first game kicks off, and then it's oh, you know it's that it's over kind of thing. But with Russia, I think it was a bit different. I think. The, the, the five actually started to become a reality the more obviously yeah. the tournament went on um, and obviously with, with Gareth Southgate I mean what a what a job he's done we can't really say he's not done anything but it's but good he, you know he's got he's got England to a semi-final in the World Cup which obviously um, is amazing for, for us and 
what was what was the, like with the players around? Obviously, I think I heard you mention that you was away for like six, seven weeks as well. From yeah. your, obviously your family and, and your children and, and your friends and what what was it like for you first of all being away from home for that long and and, and did you get homesick did you did you miss obviously um, comforts yeah yeah the comforts just the the general day to day stuff kind of thing of of your routine well, thankfully the missus is in the other room so she can't hear me but you know when you're involved in a World Cup representing your country which is effectively what I'm doing yeah it's, you don't you don't miss, do you miss your children yeah of course you do but. It's you, once in a lifetime sort of thing, you, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. one of them. You, you know, you just in. absolutely things like that don't come on that. As it happens, I was lucky enough to be in South Africa and Brazil, but you know, it's just it was an unbelievable experience. You know, twenty five minutes away from the final was just was um, direct. Go what, on, sorry, Dad. You go, sorry, Dad. Just just speaking of that final, um, did did the players believe it themselves that it, it was coming home kind of thing? Um, what was that material? Was it just still taken game by game? I mean, it was getting very close. It's was the getting excited kind of thing, or was it just saying it's the next game? We need to win this game before we can think about the yeah, next game. Similar kind to what of I was going to ask, was the excitement because there? It, like, what was yeah, they so it's not, as well it, as us at home? It's not something that can happen every week. It's a it's a World Cup final. It's it's the biggest thing in football for a lot of players, and it's not something that can happen each week. It's not it's not a, a Champions League that happens every year or a promotion that happens every year kind of thing. Now, I'm, I'm disappointed I don't know how many of the lads in Russia were in Brazil. I'm going to say there wasn't many, I don't think. Yeah, I, I agree. I've had I don't think, think there's many, many, was there? No, I don't think so. Um, and you know what? They, you know when everything's grounded, and that's why we did so well, because no one got carried away. Everyone did take one game at a time, but they're watching all the videos of the fans back home. They're, you know, they can see it or how it's building, you yeah. know, from the groups to the... Uh, fourth round of the quarterfinals and semi-final they're taking it all in all the videos are getting played on the big screen for the players it's all used as motivational and stuff like that you know the celebration in the in the parks and the the beer flying everywhere it's you know they love to watch <laughs> yeah. it they does, does that boost the lads on as well seeing it's that knowing, or does it give them yeah, yeah boost. So it doesn't put any more pressure I'm thinking you know, you've got millions of people back at home thinking this is coming home, and we, we've got to bring it home, or else you know it's game over for us, kind of thing. They're they're watching them on they're watching them on the phones when they're sat getting ready for training. They're watching these videos on the phones. You know, they're they're watching them all. They didn't miss any of it. I think the whole it's coming home shtick oh, is true. is a bit of a, a inside joke to us all now because you know it's been so long and every year it's oh it's, yeah. it's happening. I think it's just it's not so much it's coming home. I think it's like a togetherness, isn't it? Like. We all believe yeah. that we one day will will win something. We just don't know when. <laughs> we just don't know when. Yeah. Let's hope he's in Qatar. Hopefully, yeah. It's getting closer. We, we, we're improving. We're getting. We've got a, a lot, a lot of talent yeah. coming through. Very, yeah. very good talent. Um, it's it's all promising for me. I, I believe it's only going to get better. <laughs> yeah, it's it's promising signs, isn't it? I mean, um, being in a semi final of a World Cup. It's it's a it's a bit better than what we've done obviously in previous years. Yeah. Um, it, the only way is up kind of thing. So I'm kind of aim for the aim for the sky, um, and hopefully in my lifetime I will, I will actually <laughs> see him. Yeah, win win some whether it be the Euros or obviously a uh, World Cup. There's one thing. moment I want um, to ask about, and it was when Kieran Trippier just curled in that <laughs> free kick into the the top corner. Like, what was that feeling? Because for me, sitting in front of the telly, I was thinking like, we're gonna do this. Like it's happening. Can I uh, elaborate on that? What was the stadium yeah. feel? It, it, do you know what it's uh, the whole day? You know when you because I'm a fan of England as well. If I if I yes, hadn't been yeah. there working, I'm on the terraces. You know I'm over there. I used to go and follow England as well. The whole the whole day really the build up a couple of days. You know when you could just sense something. Yeah, yeah. The, the England players were never overconfident. They were just you know confident. They. You know, they've got no other any all the reason to be anything but confident. Yeah. You know when the national anthem's playing and you're singing it and everyone's singing it even louder than they did against Colombia yeah. and Sweden in the previous rounds. Just that sort of stuff, you could feel it building and and to score after three or four minutes. I think there was about something like eleven thousand England fans in the stadium, yeah. which is a lot. Yeah. You know, it was it's one of them moments you'll never forget where you were. It's one of them, like, I, I, I can feel my hair standing goosebumps. up. Yeah, goosebumps. I can feel yeah. it standing goosebumps up. Just thinking about even, it now, even yeah. now, yeah, goosebumps. It's, it's, it yeah. was amazing. Yeah, now, I got emotional singing the national anthem. You know, it's just one of them. You can't help it. 
What's no, yeah. touching on the national anthem as well? What what is that actually like? Standing there at Wembley or or where where, where be yeah. you know? And you've got all the fans around. You're bouting out the national anthem. You've got the players obviously there with you as well. What describe to us if you can uh, what that's like? You, you can't describe it because I know how lucky I am, and I know there's 30 million other blokes in this country who want to be exactly where I am. Every yeah. single football fan, every man on the street wants to be doing what I'm doing. I've, you know, I, I don't get away from that. I know how lucky I am. It is the best feeling in the world. When you look to your right or left, when you're singing the national anthem and the whole end is full of England fans, you can't see anything other than England flag, St. George's crosses. I can't yeah. tell you how good it is. I can't, honestly. Yeah, it's I bet, I bet it's a surreal, surreal, like I say, once in a lifetime kind of, kind of feeling of standing there and um the, you know the hair standing up and and the roar of the lads afterwards and things like that. I bet I, I, does that do you think and obviously you know you tell us does that pump the lads up even more they're, they're out there you know it's the country they're playing with pride and passion and they've got everyone around them and the big roar after the national anthem goes up does that pump them up as well does yeah. that England fan, I don't know if you've ever been to an England game abroad if you haven't you'd make an effort and do it you'd put it on your bucket list yeah. yeah, England fans abroad are unbelievable. You know, if, if yeah. we're playing in Tokyo tonight, there's 10,000 England fans there. It's just what England fans do yeah. wherever yeah. they go. And no one really misbehaves anymore. It's, you know, it's just one of those things. And when when there's a, a whole end, the last one was probably uh, the Nations Cup in Portugal when we played Swiss, uh, Holland. Yeah. And we Holland, had an upper, yeah. upper and lower tier. I think there was 8,000 fans in the one end. It was just unbelievable. The noise levels they create is fantastic. I think, like, England fans have, like, and, you know, recently, like, four or five years ago, I don't think the buzz around England was there because of the failures and the heartbreaks. I think, like, after the Euros, we all know what happened with Iceland. It's, it's one of them. I think we started to believe again. Like, I think, as a country, we started to believe. We've seen this young talent and... You've got your Sancho's, your Rashford's, your Greenwoods, and players are coming through now, and you can see the success below us, like the under 17s, the under 90s doing well. I think it just breeds the confidence again through the country with with the national. Yeah, team. they've reconnected the, the players and the management have done brilliant because they've reconnected the fans back yeah. to the England football team. Yeah, what what South got South got like as a manager as well. Around, around them. Is he, is he hands on? Is he, or is it like the same situation with, uh, like you said about Steve Clark with Keith getting involved and he, you know he, he's man his uh, assistants and that kind of thing. What's what's he like around the dressing room and? Oh, he's hands on. He's, he's got a good coaching staff behind him as well. You know, he's got. Well, there's I think there's probably thirty five staff that travel with him, and they're all all they're all brilliant. Every single department's fantastic, and he's got um, Steve Holland, who yeah. I'm sure you know. That yeah. bloke is unbelievable, by the way. He he's a, a one hell of a coach, and I, I love listening to him talk in the dressing room, and I love listening to him talk on the side of the pitch. He's one when, of those blokes you just when you, you can listen the to all day. The training videos on YouTube, his level of like knowledge and the way he comes across, he does not miss a single thing. His attention to details. No. Are You've only got to look at where he's been, by the way. You know, he's been there and done it. He's done it with them all. He's done it with some yeah. big hitters as well. Yeah. I've got a, a bit of a story. Um, is there some, uh, a, a, short, a story about Maguire's shirt at the World Cup? Well, there is, and I can tell you if you want, but you must have heard of it, and people are just going to get fed up of hearing it. In fact, if you play this and three people are listening, and they're going to go, oh, not that fucking Harry <laughs> Maguire story. <again." laughs> um, when, we, when we were in Russia, obviously everyone has squad numbers, so the shirts get made up and printed before we go out there. So we're just putting um, the decals of the game on it, and maybe the sleeve patches yeah. and stuff like that. And they've gone out, all the shirts are hanging up and they've gone out to do the warm up and they've come back in. So there's only about seven or eight minutes in between them coming in from the warm up to them putting, changing boots, whatever, putting their shirt on. Um, and they've just come in and Harry has shouted, uh, he's just about to put his match shirt on. Some of them have already got their anthem jackets on. That's how close they are to going out. And, he, and Harry shouted something like, Frosty, you've printed me a shirt big enough for me, Granddad. I can't fucking wear this. And I don't know what had happened, whether it had been wrong sized, you know, because it, it can happen. It could be marked up large and it's an extra large or whatever. So I had to try and print a shirt up in three or four minutes. There's two of us. I've got a very, very, very good assistant. He's not an assistant. He's 
he works with me. He's one of, you know, we will take it in turns. He'll go out on the pitch to collect the balls in after the warm up, and I'll go in to make sure the lads are sorted. We'd alter, alternate. It just so happens this day, I decided to go in the dressing room. And then you've got about three minutes to print up a shirt for Harry. It's quiet in the dressing room, so everyone's focused on me trying to find um, a name block, letters, numbers, a shirt, all to print up within three or four minutes. The gaffer's over my shoulder. You know, he's watching, seeing it, see what I'm doing and what have you. And he's literally put it on as he's walking out the dressing room with all the lads are lining up in the tunnel. It was a bit of a pressure moment, but, you know, we got through it. And I think he scored after about 10 minutes. Did, did you actually change your size of a shirt? Well, the lad who works with me, Neil, says we don't think we did. Yeah. We, we're not sure what happened. We, You know, it could have been one of these things where he thought it was maybe a bit baggy or whatever. We just, we genuinely don't know. Yeah, all one of them superstitious job, things. Yeah, our job is to make sure the players are going out, not worrying about boots or shin pads or shirts. Yeah. Exactly. The last thing they want, or the head coach wants, is someone asking for different size shorts, literally just as they're going out. They want us to be focused on the game. So it's a bit of a pressure moment, but we got through it. And like I said, he scored. It's a bit of a moment as well when yeah. you see players swapping boots. Like, is that to do with... Again, superstition, or is it just purely to do with? Oh, I, I'm not per- pitch. Yeah, pitch, or I'm not performing well in these. But last week I scored in the other one, so I want them on. Or is it? Is, well, it could yeah. be exactly that. If you know, they they could slip over after a minute, purely for nothing to do with the boots. But the ones, if they yeah. get into the head, it's the boot, yeah. and they want to change it, and that's it. You know, we with England, we sometimes have three or four pairs of boots on the side, just in case they want to change. They'll give us them yeah. to take out, you know, just in case. Who's who's the most who's the player with the most boots? Um, well, listen, they've all got. People ask this story, and I, I, I'm not. I get fed up with people saying, "Oh, how many pairs of boots does he need?" You know, these boots cost eighty quid. Yeah. They're the that they're, they're the most important thing a player can have. No one ever says to me, "How many flipping cars does um?" I don't follow Formula One, but who's the bloke who drives for us? What's his Lewis name? Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. No one says how many cars has he got. A five million in the pot, but he's got five I in the background. Like to know, to <laughs> <be honest>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most players have got three or four pairs of boots. You know, this is just yeah. what they have. They have a couple of moles and a couple of pairs of studs. Do, 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 do they train in the same ones as they're playing, or have they got match day ones and training ones? No, they have match day and they have training boots. I say they've all got three or four pairs. Trent Alexander Arnold, he just comes up with two pairs every game. Every training session, two two pairs, and that's it. That's all he uses. It's a it's a funny yeah. one with, with boots. Like how, I mean, I suffer when you have a new pair of boots, you get blisters. Is is there anything you do to the boots to prevent to prevent that? Like this, just or is it just them sort of wearing them to to bed them in? No, they'll wear them, and we've got a, a machine that can stretch them half a size overnight and stuff like that. So if they wear them for training, a bit. Uh, the day before, which is what they do if they're playing match boots. Uh, I've, I, I very rarely do they wear a brand new pair of boots yeah, just yeah, for the yeah. game without wearing them at any point, you know. And if they if they want them stretching a little bit, we'll stretch them a little bit. And we'll, I, we'll move on as well because I am quite curious of the time because um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, tell us the story behind the England under 20s women's uh, World Cup win and meeting Prince, uh, was it Prince Charles? He's actually under 20 men. It was under 20 men. He Prince definitely William. hasn't done his own work, has he? I could have sworn it was the women. Sorry, I do apologise. <laughs> no, it was the men. The, the women, we won bronze in 2018. Oh, okay. I actually flew from Russia to almost straight to France to do the under 20 women's World Cup in France, and we finished third there. But we did win under 70, under 20 men. They won it in 2017. In fact, the three lads who played up front, Adam Armstrong, he scored three yesterday for Blackburn. <laughs> Yeah, John Calvert Lewin, who scored the winner in the final, scored three against mm. us. Yeah, and they were talking about that. Did Dom Slanky score yesterday as well? Yeah, he did. He, yeah, did. he did. Yeah, yeah. And he was man of the match in the final. I by the way, watching that game. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So the, the final. Yeah. What? So it, it was it was Prince William, wasn't it? You met Prince him. Yeah, we, we we got invited to Kensington Palace afterwards. Yeah. What was it? What was it like meeting Prince William? Well, this is going to sound awful and really big time, but I actually met him before. He, oh, came right, okay. to, uh, <laughs> he came into the dressing room at um, Joe, uh, I want to say Johannesburg in 2010. Yeah. 
Um, he definitely didn't remember me, but, you know, he came in there, so I'd met him then, and then we got invited to the uh, Kensington Palace, and the head coach, Paul Simpson, uh, introduced me to him, and, he's, and Prince uh, William said, nice to meet you, and I went, again. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't remember. He didn't did remember. Him. He's a big no. Villa fan, is he not? Or is, am I thinking? Of, yeah, yes, he is. He is. Yeah. We did have a chat about that, actually. Yeah, and what, what did he say? Did he say anything interesting? No, not at all. He's got no. more important people to speak to than me, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was a good experience. You don't, yeah. you, again, it's a once in a lifetime. Once in it? a lifetime. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, and so we've talked obviously a lot about a lot what you do and, 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 and what you do, what you've done at the Albion and what you're doing for England. What do you get up to on your time off? Have you got any other hobbies then? I know which we'll touch on again in, in a little bit about the team in Wales, which I'm not going to yeah. pronounce because I don't know how to. No, um, but we're going to uh, we're going to talk about and say so what what other hobbies do you do and what do you do just to just to generally relax and, and and get away from football, for example. Well, I've got four children and a grandchild. Okay. Two wives, one ex, one present. <laughs> so, <laughs> plenty to keep me occupied. I've collect Adidas trainers for my Sid. That's amazing. By that, the way. Is a, that is a that, big that's amazing. Connection. That's amazing, by the way. Again, it's in, yeah. We'll talk about that in a second as that's well amazing. because we cannot we cannot talk cannot okay. not talk about. Can I, I try to ask a question? That. How many pairs? Uh, I got on show. I think there's about 120, but in the garage, I've got another 60 or 70 pairs. And just for the record, that's not a lot. Some of the Adidas collectors I know have got I know thousands. Darren, Darren Some of them have got has a ridiculous amount of shoes. Darren Bent, yeah. Oh, I think you've spent too much time with Ben Foster because I think he's got a bit of a, a bit of a collection of trainers as well, hasn't he? He's a Nike man. I was there the morning. He managed to get. He won't mind me telling you this. I don't think he managed to get a pair of the Nikes when they were released in America that Michael J. Fox wore in the film. Um, what was that film with the uh, car in? You, uh, you three are too young, aren't you? Probably. Me and Dyke might be, I don't know about Macy. <laughs> Thanks, mate, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think now. Um... He wore a pair of snazzy Nike trains in the film with the DeLorean oh, back car. back to the future. That's the one. That's, That's the one. it. Back to the future, yeah, of course Yeah, he managed to get a pair of those. So he collects Nike, old Benjamin does. Yeah. There's, there's a big question. Was it difficult to leave West Brom to go to England? Like, was it a decision you had to think about? Or was it just one of them, like, I'm going to England? No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that easy, actually, because um, I'd worked with England since 2004. Yeah. And I, I've got a transport business, which is how I earn, which is how I earn a living, basically. I transport the kit across Europe for England, Scotland and Wales in vans, and I supply them with kitmen. So I've got 14 or 15 kitmen who work for me, and I supply them to England, Scotland and Wales as and when they need them. Um, and I was working in 2004, started working in 2004 for England, and then... The job came up. I was on, we were going on holiday, on a family holiday to uh, Kos or Greece, uh, Greek, Rhodes or Greece, Kos. Was that the year you was in Kos and you messaged me because I was in Kos and you and I was was going to meet up for a, a drink? But I and said I, you got a pay, so you didn't turn up. Was that, <laughs> yeah, that was it, yeah. That I think, sounds I think, like it, I think I, I think I sent a picture out of, um, of Turkey and, and you messaged me saying, is that Turkey? And I was like, yeah, he's like, I'm in Kos too. What year was uh, that? Was I, that 2011? It, yeah, it would have been. Yeah, I would have been about twenty-one. Yeah, it would have been around that time. Yeah. So we were flying about six o'clock in the morning. So we'd got to get up really early and get to the airport. So I didn't go to bed that night. But the, about two o'clock in the morning, I put on the laptop. I thought I'll just make sure Albion aren't playing Rhodes Town away or something like that. <laughs> and there was a um, an advert after they were advertising the first team kit man. So I sent the worst email in the world. You know, not applying for the job, but you know, telling them I'd be interested. And about two o'clock that day, we're lying by the pool. And I get a phone call from a lad called Andy Marriott, who was the play liaison officer at Albion at the time. Yeah. And we spoke over the phone and he offered me the job there and then. That's how it came about. When I actually came to leave Albion in 2014, first of all, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was tell Steve Clark I was leaving. But in between me telling Steve Clark I was leaving and me actually leaving, he got sacked in December. And I got on brilliant with Keith and Dean. And they were like, Pat, look, we could do with you to the end of the season, you know, blah, 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 and was one of them. And the, the England World Cup was coming up in Brazil later on that year. And 
it, it was a tough decision. In fact, I'm not going to lie, I shed a tear when I, I remember Chris, a lad called Chris Hall, who's doing Albion TV. He came into the dressing room, the last away game I did, which was West Ham. Yeah. And he said, oh, can we just, you know, you're leaving today. Can we just do a bit? I said, yeah, you can, Chris. I said, but we're doing it without um, video. I said, I'll talk, but I'm not doing it video because I'll end up getting upset. It was one of them. So, you know, yeah. we did do a bit of chatting, but we didn't, I didn't let him film it because I knew what I would imagine it's like a lifelong dream to even be West Brom's kit, man. Never mind England kit, man. As yeah, well, exactly. So. Yeah. 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 Would, you ever, would yeah. you ever go back to the album? Would you ever give up England? Uh, and go back to well, not even the album. Would you ever go to any other club as well, or is it just your main focus now is as as being the England senior kit man for as long and well, for as long as you can? I definitely won't be Jack in England. Uh, will they get rid of me? You never know. You never know what's around the corner. <clears throat> you know, it might it always treat you at the next camp as if it's your last because you just don't know what's going to happen. You never know. Yeah. Uh, Do managers ever have... bring in their own kit man? In, an international level, uh, yeah, international. So if like Southgate um, got sacked and they brought someone else in and they literally turned up and went, he's bringing his own, obviously his backroom staff in, and, and that includes a kit man. Would that be Bob I Pat kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, it would. It, it happens yeah. in football, you know, no two ways yeah. about it. I'd like to think it won't happen just yet. I'd like yeah. to think I'm not going to get rid of Gareth. No, um, but yeah, no, definitely happens in football. That's why you know when fans get the ump over players not being loyal and stuff like that. It's, it's no different. You know, clubs aren't loyal necessarily to players either. It works both ways. And players get, for instance, Craig Dawson's a great example, isn't he? Yeah. He got huge. so much stick for going to Watford and stuff like that. But do you know what? I remember Shane Long when he went to Hull. And the fans, I think we played Hull a couple of weeks after he left. Weeks after, yeah. But I'm telling you now, the bloke didn't want to go. Yeah. The club have got to balance the books. You know, they get, a, they get a raw deal, players do. They get Because fans just think they don't want to play for their clubs in my opinion it's not always the case what stops them from coming out and saying that though to the media are they, are they not allowed to to physically you know come out and do an interview and say listen I, I love West Brom and I didn't want to leave and I had to well there's, that- there's no way anyone who, I know, who I've worked with is going to come out and say I've been stitched up by that bloody club people don't do it because you no, never know they, happen, they might want yeah. to come back one day yeah know, so they're never going to come out I and think- slaughter them but it, it does work I both ways. With, uh, with Lee Camp, yeah. with with Derby, I know he left in like unsavoury sort of terms, and we've always, whenever we've played Birmingham, we've we've given him the rounds of it. And I think in a podcast, uh, I, I can't remember we did. It, I think it was a Derby podcast. He was talking about it. And he said he actually never wanted to leave. He said he only left because obviously at the time we had Lee Grant and Lee Camp, and Grant was the one we was favouring. He said I had to play, or else my career would have sort of failed and yeah. he, he went yeah. to Forest which made him an even more hated person to Derby fans I was going to say I think I think you're giving the rounds more yeah, because he went well, to Forest it, again it all happens he plays to us we play to him it's like the pantomime villain sort of thing but he did he did say in a podcast he, he loves Derby but he, he, he'll never be able to look at us the same because of the amount of abuse we've gave him over the years and yes yeah and he, he came to Albion by the way and he's a really yeah, really genuine seems, nice like bloke yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay. Well, moving on then to the team in Wales, which, if you could pronounce it for me, that'd be great. Pronounce it. It's Carnarvon. Surely you Carnarvon. 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 We asked our Welsh mate how to pronounce it, and he he couldn't tell us. <laughs> um, he's o- he's Welsh, only half, half Welsh. He doesn't speak Welsh. He's half. He's half Welsh. Yeah. He's gonna uh, eat us. He's gonna eat us. So much. We it's not even we half Welsh <laughs> if you can't we can't take got, Carnarvon. We got asked um, to obviously ask you about that, and we wanted to touch on it anyway. And um, someone asked us as well to ask you about fish cakes. So, so about your team uh, in Wales and your fish cakes. The lad who asked you to ask about fish cakes, unbelievably, he lived in Wales the same time as I did. And okay. And Albion. And yeah. it was only when, i tell you how we came, our paths crossed. Uh, after one game once, which Albion had won, James Morrison booted a ball into the crowd at the final whistle, and his daughter caught it. And she never gave it back, the little shy stuff. <laughs> so I, t- he, I touched base with them then and I got the ball signed for them, what have you, and then found out that he was brought up in Carnarvon and went to school there the same time as I did. So I was born in West Bromwich, but then moved to Carnarvon in 69. So my early years in the 70s was spent in Carnarvon and I used to go and watch him with my old man. And then okay. over the last few years, I've just got back into it and now I'm on the board of directors. I was at Barrytown yesterday, which is a seven-hour round trip from Telford, so... You, I don't need to tell you that's commitment. I don't miss any, I don't yeah. miss any games. 
I'll be going to Flint away next Wednesday night, you know. How, how, how did they get on yesterday? Uh, we were got robbed 3-1. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I, well, no I hope they obviously, they do a lot better. And um, obviously, you're on the on the board of directors there as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What What's that like, being involved at a, at a small club and, and being on the board? I'd love them to do uh, all or nothing with Canada Town. Yeah. Because it, it's unbelievable. The, the volunteers on the board, the fans, the local community... Carnarvon is one of the most deprived areas in Wales. It's got one of the highest unemployment rates in North Wales. It's got a, a population of about 12,000. They're the fifth best supported club in Wales. And if it wasn't for the volunteers and the fans, the yeah. club wouldn't exist. They do an unbelievable like my, job. Yeah. And obviously mine the and Jordan's local club, uh, they're very well supported at Ilkeston Town. We're massively supported. And it, it sort of, yeah. uh, when you sort of town comes together it's, it's quite crazy to to believe really isn't it like there's that many people in such a small area well yeah. i'm glad you've mentioned ilkeston because i've known them take three thousand yeah. in yeah. away game i'll follow wow. i'll follow the ilkeston i have with their fans because they've got they played middlesbrough in the yes. cup didn't they not so long ago and i think they took three thousand fans in them didn't they lads just give me i'm just going to turn my talk it's a bit <laughs> Kind of yeah, I just thought that. I thought yeah. what's going on. We won't we won't keep you too much longer, Pat, because we we don't want to because we know I'm you've obviously no got a no Are you sure? Absolutely certain. Um, because we we obviously we do we do really appreciate it. and I, and I know um I know you're a nice guy anyway because um I remember that, that. The longer it takes, the more I get paid, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, we'll pay you in fish cakes. I basically couldn't even buy you a point. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what's, what's the story behind the fish cakes then? There's no story. I just have fish cake and chips wherever I go. Oh, right, I okay. Starve and I go and get fish cake and chips. It's just it's a go-to. little bit of a ritual. What's, what, what kind of fish? What, what fish is it? God knows what. It's probably all the oh, dregs. Dunno. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, They're only about it? 30p. Do you want to move on to quick fire then, Beats? Yeah, yeah we'll, do, we'll do the quick fires now. Uh, Jordan Doughty, you can do you can do this bit if you want. All right, um, we'll just do some quick fire questions, and you give us straight away the answer um, of whatever whatever it is. Um, and then we've got about about fifteen questions that people have asked us on social the media viewers, last year. Yeah. Um, and then and, and then that's it really. Then Jordan, we'll you, you do the you I'll do the evens. Go on, mate. I'm going to start with, uh, with a little fun. England or West Brom. There's a, no, there's a no comment coming here. There's a no comment. <laughs> yeah, 50 50. Very good. Away. away. Blue and white or yellow and green? Yellow and green. Uh, if you could be an animal, what would you be? A. A. <laughs> similar build. <laughs> what's your favourite movie? <laughs> Aaron Brockovich. TV series, what's your favourite? TV, what, TV series. Um, what was that police drama that everyone raves about? Uh, <laughs> the one on BBC One. It's that good. I can't even remember the name. Uh, Line of Duty. Uh, Line of Duty. Yes. The missus got me into that. Fair enough. Yeah, um, it's good. Think, it's a good series. I think we've already asked. Uh, you've already touched on this, but favorite West Brom player. Uh, I'm going to say Chris Brown. Your favorite yeah. England player. At the moment, it's probably it's the obvious one. It's Harry Kane, probably. But in in my day, it was probably Stuart Pearce. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Where's the best place you've been on holiday? Uh, Carnarvon. <laughs> and uh, lastly, <laughs> what's your favourite type of music? So what you listen to just to, on a day-to-day basis? This is going to be really... You might find it funny. I don't own a CD. I never listen to the radio. I'll drive to Turkey tomorrow for three days and I won't have the radio on. I don't listen to music at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a big no, I, I listen to, I listen to I'm the podcast in the car, so... Yeah. But if you push me, I'll say the Carpenters. Fair enough, fair enough. Fair enough. Right, that's that's quick fire sorted. And yeah, that's that one. Yeah. Wants to know now. Um, we're going to the the questions for the questions for Pat then off the uh, off social media, what the viewers want to want to hear and... Um, Obviously, if you, if you can't answer them for whatever reason, that's fine. Um, that means I but, won't be able to. I can tell by the look on his face. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I don't know. You might be able to. I'm not sure. Um, so the Baggies Bible asks, if you could choose one, would it be England or West Brom? 
uh, for Kitman. For Kitman? Yeah. England. I'll never go back into club football. I'm a grafter, me. I'll put a shift in. But club football is hard because if you've got kids, every single weekend, he's gone. Even through the summer because you're packing your new kit up in June. Yeah. Every single weekend, he's gone. It's hard work being a kit man at a club. Um, Anthony Keff asks, what's your favourite kit you've ever seen? Do you know what? This New England oh, yeah. kit that I printed up with the new font and the numbers... Yeah. I don't know how they keep improving it year on year, it but they fit in do. Kit, yeah. yeah, it's a good kit, isn't it? It's very, it's a very it's I, white it, kit. So I'm going to go with a new all white kit. I'm, if I've got a choice of shorts, I'd still go white, but I think it was uh, Iceland we played white, 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 and I just thought it looked yeah. brilliant. Pleasing, pleasing. Yeah. Uh, Danny asks, yeah. favourite ground to visit with England and West Brom? So what's like your favourite with England and what's your favourite? Yeah, for, for each team. Uh, well, do you know what? Wigan, as an, a fan, an away day, is brilliant because it's yeah. an unrestricted view. You can Massive park terrace. two minutes away. There's a bar right underneath. They look after you there. You yeah. take 4,500 fans. There's no yeah. hassle. It's easy to get to. So I do like that. But London away days are probably my favourite wherever I go in London. There's nothing better than getting up early and going on a train. And for England, it's uh, Wembley. There's no better place to go. Um, Jack asks as well, uh, best game you've seen live? And I'm guessing he means while, while you're working, yeah. basically, while you're obviously been a both West Brom and England again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I was lucky enough to be on the bench for the 5-1 at Molyneux. People have moaned at me for saying that, but, <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And I have to say the penalty shootout win against Colombia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah, that must be something. Was that would, that was, yeah, that's going to be we, special. We can't, we can't win a penalty shootout. Like and it's the first one we've and won then, in a major yeah. tournament. That must have been amazing. Yeah, it was. Um, just to, just to touch, on, well. hey, Sorry, just touch on, yeah. on that, what was the atmosphere around the players when Gareth Southgate was showing yeah. or he was taking the penalties? Because we've not won one in a major tournament before. It, it was a very, very big moment in obviously an England career. No, but it's all organised beforehand, yeah. of course. They take yeah, of penalties course. every day at training. Yeah. So yeah. as soon as it goes to a penalty shootout, Everyone knows who's taking the penalties. And you won't know this, but if it goes to a penalty shootout, the staff have a plan as, as to where everyone is placed for that first couple of minutes because you're not allowed on the pitch for the penalties. Only the, yeah. So there's a drink station, there's a, a jumper or T-shirt station, there's a coach station or there's an analysis station where they're all telling them, you know, people will be speaking to Jordan Pickford, the goalie coach will be chatting to him and, you know, it's very well drilled and very well organised. So it's almost like as soon as the... Whistle goes at extra time. Everyone knows who's what. Was, was that got right a role here, to play there in that then. penalty shootout? The order of what was meant to happen, which was plan, was broken. With Eric Dyer taking the, was it Eric Dyer took the winner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did the winner. Score, yeah. was, was it meant to be uh, someone else? I, don't know, I yeah. heard something like someone had cramp, and they didn't want to take that fifth penalty, uh, like beforehand, like in the huddle. And Eric sort of went, "I'll do it." I, I heard, I heard, like I'll I don't do know it. if it's tongue in cheek, like, but. I did hear rumblings of it. Uh, I don't know, but I tell you now, that's the kind of thing Eric yeah. Dyer would do because if ever it kicks off, you want to be behind Eric mm. Dyer. He, I was, you leave him at the front. I was just to say, I've been yeah. watching. I've watched the Tottenham. new um, the Tottenham yeah. documentary, and he's he's just he's their odd man, and he's he's always the one to fucking say like, let's yeah. get stuck in and kind of thing. He's a great bloke. I did yeah. an under twenties World Cup with Eric in two thousand and eleven, I think, in Turkey with the likes of. Harry Kane, Connor Cody, and what have you. You knew Eric was going to make it then. Yep. Yeah. Fair enough. Go on the mates. Right, yeah, um, Sandra asks on Twitter, your favourite WBI chant apart from the Lewis My Shepherd? Uh, well, I was a big fan of the Goran Popoff one. I mate, yep. <laughs> that was, that was a good chant. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you sing it if the two lads don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they know. I'm not going to boast you with my uh, singing skills. Um, but it, it was along the lines of Papa, uh, Popeye. Uh, yeah. Team tune, so yeah, it was good. Um, Sean asks for both again for England and West Brom. Who's the nicest player in football, and also the nicest manager you've played? Uh, they've been under and against. Uh, definitely the nicest manager I played against was Roberto Martinez. When I was kit man at um, Albion, we played Everton away while he was there, and their kit man basically is a lad called Jimmy Martin. I think he runs the club anyway. If you know what I mean, he's one of those blokes who's been there. For, yeah. since the year dots but he, he's there and they're having a little bit of lunch before the game and he's come and got me it's about 12 o'clock before anyone's got there 
and I've just sat in his office with me, the Everton kit man, and Roberto Martinez just chatting. And then unbelievably at um, Brazil, he's turned up there to watch, it might have been Kale possibly or someone like that, I can't remember. And he's remembered me. And he's just, you know, how I sort of think. So he was a really nice chap. Belgium at the World Cup? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah. That must be, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. It was the worst manager that you've played against. If you yeah, can say, if you can't okay. say, then. I don't, I don't think they mean tactically. I think they mean the worst. A bit, yeah. bit of an arsehole kind yeah, of thing. A bit of, a bit of a dick, yeah. Well, listen, when you're losing and you're sat in the dugout next to you, you're arseholes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. true. They, you know, you'd be amazed what goes on between the two benches. I've been at Albion. I, I don't want to mention, I don't want to say too much, but when you get invited to go back to the coaches the head coach of the opposition's room for a glass of wine what have you the number of times people don't go back and refuse to go back because of yeah. what's gone on in during the game you've seen that with the, um, with Lampard yeah. and Klopp last season and Klopp yeah. yep yeah yeah no, yeah. yeah it's all yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 part of the game I watched yeah Lampard yeah, because it's Lampard's all part a of the game, by the way. It's all good fun. Of course it is. Of course it is. Yeah, it's all passion in it. It's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing against each other. The, the, the think, friends by next one. Some of the yeah, greatest it's... rivalries in football are enhanced by managers, like with with Absolutely. with Jose. I mean, Jose is an enemy to everybody, really. I mean, there isn't many people who like Jose Mourinho, but he's he's a character. He's he's uh, yeah. I think. He's a yeah. winner, isn't he? And I think you've got to have that nasty streak to become a winner. You can't, you can't be nice to everybody. You can't be nice in everybody. football. I don't think you can. Yeah, he, was think, on the bench. he was on the bench when we were, West Brom were about to be the first team to beat Chelsea at Stamford Bridge when they had a penalty with the last kick of the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they drew. we drew. ended up drawing 2-2 and it kicked off in the tunnel and what have you. He's, you know, yeah. one of them things. he's flamboyant, he isn't in, he? Yeah, he was in a monk. Yeah, he looks yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. I, I've... I think you so um nicest player. For Do you know what? I just, West Ham or England. I, I mean I, I imagine most a lot of them are top guys, yeah. Brilliant. They're all brilliant. The most they of them, know yeah. we they know we look after and put a shift in them. They're of course, all yeah. brilliant with us. That I, I couldn't single anybody out because they're just great blokes to work with, all of them. Okay. Well, 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 put it this way, I've never come across anyone who I thought yeah. flipping it. I ain't doing that mm. for him. Fair enough. You know, so. right, we'll carry on while Danny yeah, is doing whatever he's but, doing um sophie asses oh sorry no luke asses the biggest superstitious the most superstitious player for england and west brom like who who has the either the quir- the quirk so is it, or is it, is it sort of most like who who's well ben ben foster always used to have have to have a little block of dairy milk on his peg <laughs> for half time with a cup of coffee <laughs> Uh, Shane Long always liked a can of Pepsi or Coke at the end of a game, just for a bit of sugar rush. Sugar, yeah. You know, um, and superstition, it has to be Carl with his pants because they're, you know, they, they give us sleepless, <laughs> sleepless nights, they do. <laughs> we try to buy some that are exactly it, the same to keep it in a skip just in case we do lose them, <laughs> but we can't find any. <laughs> eight. Number eight. Um... Michael, Michael asks, who's the uh, the joker of the squad with England? Who's the biggest prankster slash joker? Well, you're going to laugh at this. Me and the other kit man, Neil, didn't think it was funny. Because in the evenings, we'll put kit outside their rooms. If it's late at night and there's, they're, tr- they're getting changed at the hotel, we'll put their kit outside the rooms. Yep. Yeah. We've done it one night. And we still don't know for sure, because we've not had the bottle to ask him or them, that we think Jaden Sancho and Raheem Sterling swapped everybody's kit over. <laughs> okay. yeah. See, I knew you'd laugh, but then when they come to training the next morning, you get it. And we haven't really got any spare stuff. Everyone's it's saying, fault. "Why have I got a small T-shirt?" You know, why have I've I just got, got the new... vision of what, Harry Maguire trying to fit in Raheem Sterling's shirt? It's all like tight. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what happened. <laughs> and there was only you keep it the wrong shirt again. Yeah, that's it. And there's only two people at the training session who was with normal top on. <laughs> Which was Jade and Raheem <laughs> Sterling. So, but also when Marcus and Jesse are together, they're imagine, very. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine but as well. In a good way, they're good lads to have around now. I've also um, through Tottenham, Tottenham's in, in ground training videos when, from when Kyle Walker was there. Kyle Walker's a big prankster as well. Yeah, no, he can be a pain in the backside in a good yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen some of the videos of the Man City uh, YouTube videos as well, where he locks uh, yeah. mourned in a few yeah. people on the bus, on the bus yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I think Tammy Abraham and Mason Mount are, are 
quite funny. And Declan Rice as well. I've seen clips of Mason and Declan doing with things. Wilkshire when he when he's ironing. Yeah, him. yeah. It's... yeah. Declan yeah, and Mason yeah. were also good friends. To I've be seen fair. the clip of him scaring yeah. him on the was it was on the yacht or something on Wilkeshire in in, in uh, the uh, washing machine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this that brings us to our last question. Uh, Jamie asked if you could be a footballer, what position would you play and why? What do you mean if I could be a footballer? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's what the, the question says. Question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what they've asked. So, what is position, is writing. What position would you play? Well, in the old days, I was a right winger. There we go. Okay. I, I once had a very, very brief trial for Stoke City. They sent someone to come and watch me once. Oh, okay. Oh, right. okay. Cold there Tuesday night in Stoke. That would have been 1976. I have, I have got a few more as well. That came through at last minute, so there's only a couple of more. Um, well, the new bits. Rainbow Stand asks the most bizarre player request that you've ever received. Kyle Walker and his Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep going back to them, but, I don't, you know, it sounds boring, but... It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that is what, what it is. It is. I can't make anything up, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, again, we've touched on this already, but we'll ask it. Rainbow Stand as well has also asked, who has the most pairs of boots on a match day? Um, I'm going to say that is Jordan Pickford. Pickford. Well, I'm not I'll tell you what, it. though. It's definitely what, Jordan what, Pickford. What a penalty <laughs> that lad can take as well. He, yeah. can, he can smash in a few penalties. Yeah, he's got some bottle, by um, the way, he has. And again, Rainbow Stand, this is the last question from him. He as asked, busy, uh, <laughs> most arrogant player you've had to sort out. And I'm guessing um, from what we've touched on earlier about when you said about, you know, you, there's not one player where you can say I wouldn't do that for him. I don't think there is any that you've ever asked. I'm not lying. There isn't a single arrogant player I I've think worked think as, as a fan's perspective, yeah. I mean, I know at Albion there was a few, like, unsavoury things with Adam Wingy and Barahino, but I guess that's more of as a fan's perspective. I mean, as men, they must be brilliant men as such. Yeah, no, I had a, yeah. Yeah, no, I had a really good relationship with Sido. In fact, when he signed his new deal, I think the headline in the paper was, I used to earn less than the kit man. That wasn't true, just for the record. He definitely earned more than me. <laughs> um, so I was there when he got, I moved him around from what they would call the reserve dressing room round to the first team dressing room. And he was as good as gold. I, you can, I can only speak as I find. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, obviously he, he moved, his career moved a bit more on when I'd left. He got into the England under 21s and stuff like that. Well, he the got Tottenham into the England moved, senior team, didn't he? Didn't happen. What, what, yeah. I mean, yeah, what, what a player he, he was. He was, um, he was on this show and definitely to, to become at the top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, he was. His team was. was really good. And I think whatever happened outside of football, affected the run crowd him, or whatever yeah. it may have been or whatever affected him in, in yeah. such a bad way. And obviously, um, it, I don't yeah, know if he's still in Belgium. Belgium I think he's he? playing in Belgium, isn't it? Um, with that as well, Pat, I don't know if he was there at the time. And again, you don't have to answer, but there was a, a rumour going around that obviously so, uh, one player had got in an altercation with Sido where Sido might have ended up on his backside in the dressing room after a game but was that was that true was you was you there then or I, I, it, it is true but i you'd have to ask your next guest about that yeah yeah thought so okay cool <laughs> um, game last game of the last home game of the season when, season yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yes. wicked lovely um, the story about that yeah i, I, I just say i imagine that's just because emotions are raw with Within football, it's passion, and it was just passion. Yeah, it's of just, course, always. It's yeah. just, it, to me, it's just the lads giving a shit. Yeah, I say, me, oh, that, that, that's all. Relating it, it, it to a more just, friendship you know, level, me and Jordan, when we we could play six aside together, and I'll we'll have an argument on the football pitch. I'm just looking this in, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, it's it's football. You argue. It's done. When you get off the pitch, you. Your mates again, yeah. It's done, friends yeah. Your friends again, like, yeah. Of course, yeah. There's no course. friends in football for ninety minutes. That, that's no, the way. you can't. We, you we've had can't. that conversation before, haven't we? There's no, there's no friends in football for ninety minutes. No. Um, the last, the last question we have got is to do with Peter Adam Wingy. Um, what, what happened with Peter with with the uh, the, the deadline day drive to QPR? Shall we say? If you know anything about it, it was. Was he actually told? Because to this day, he says he was, but obviously a lot of people say that actually he had no right to be going down there. It wasn't, um, well, it wasn't I, agreed with the club like kind of thing. I, have to, I had to pick up the pieces in the dressing room afterwards, if you know what I mean, because obviously the move fell through and yeah. then he gets moved out of the first team dressing room. He, gets, he has to train by himself in the afternoons. He has to get changed in one of the youth team dressing rooms. So it was actually a, a, a sad time for me because... 
I was a massive Peter fan, and any yeah, album yeah. fan now will say, you know, it's possibly the best stroke we've had over the last 10 years. So it was a tough time for me because you have to tie the party line and yeah. you have to do what you're told. Was he told to go down? I, I don't know his don't honest know. answer. All I know yeah. is that Dan Ashworth was in charge what and Dan Ashworth did everything brilliantly. So I, yeah. you'd have to ask Dan that. I don't know. Um, he, he's, he's, he was a good lad, weren't he, Dan? Did a, did a yeah, lot of good things for the club. Him. Never replaced him. Yeah, no, I don't so think we have. It, it was a tough time as a fan and me working there because... I really felt sorry for Peter. Some of the pros probably wouldn't have felt sorry for him. Yeah. But yeah. when you see how it properly affected him, it, you know, it affected think, me as well at the time. Did it affect any of the team, any of the lads? Um, well, they were just like, well, Peter's still here. Like, you know, he's, he's still he's still one of us. Or is it like, actually, keep, yeah, you, you, yeah. you know, you didn't want to be here. Like, yeah, go away and train on your own over there or whatever. Or... Well, he was, he almost didn't have any contact with him because... He's coming in at two, three o'clock in the afternoon when the lads are going home, and he's then coming in. So it, it's basically one of the coaching staff, um, the kit man, and yeah. a couple of the other staff, and he's out on the pitch. There was it nobody else involved. For a player to sort of, you know, the move was the move was right. off. The move was off. The move's off, and he, he's got to go back to to the club where you know it, it is going to look funny for you, you, your big figures. I mean, I can imagine. The hierarchy at the club, he was probably shunted straight to the bottom, and nobody, yeah, nobody really, you know, right, they could still remain friends, but in, in a football perspective, you, I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not sure he played yeah, much for yeah. us after that. In fact, I don't, I don't think, he, think did. he did. No, I don't I, think he did. I uh, definitely uh, remember him warming up, and somebody in the frosty. said something to him, and he said something yeah. back. And yeah. um, Steve Clark has sent the sports science lad down to go and get him to bring him back up. So I don't think he actually played again. Yeah, for it us must after be that. difficult. Again, obviously he probably wants to honour his contract. I mean, as a footballer, I can only imagine that you're being given X amount of pounds of football to do 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 what you love. You know what I mean? And if if he can't yeah, do what yeah. he loves, it must affect him as a person as well as you know, as, as a professional. He, he was a good honest bloke. We had a couple of um, um, laundry ladies who worked at the club, and I'm I'm not kidding now. He would empty his wallet, pack. Look after the ladies. Give you know, share this out. Whatever cash he got on him, he, you know, a couple a couple of hundred quid. Sometime he said, "Go and share it out with the girls and what have you." You know, he was one of those kind of blokes. Fair play. Um, but that's all the questions we've got. Um, <clears throat> the only question that we've got uh, for you is, um, which will be a rolling thing for every guest, is: Can you recommend anyone to come on our podcast that would be willing to? Um. We may even throw in a fish cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I normally go double uh, fish well, cake, to be I'm fair. Sure we can, I'm sure <laughs> we can sort that out. Yeah. We, we give you triple. Do you know what? You, you, there's other departments who are working for England in the medical team and stuff like that. Maybe I'll speak to one of them because their yeah, stories I are even better than imagine, mine. Yeah, the medical yeah, yeah that, that, that'd, awesome. that'd be great, yeah. yeah. I'm not great, saying yeah. it, but he might yeah. do. It's a different yeah. side of football, isn't it? I suppose yeah. You're dealing with players yeah, when they is. when they be at the weakest, yeah. when at the uh, low. If they don't if they don't mind li listening to us rattle on and ask them questions <laughs> left, right, and centre, then then yeah, if, if so, let yeah. us know. I've got some stories on deadline day, but you can imagine what their stories are yeah, when they do. Yeah. Oh yeah, deadline day. of course, I mean, yeah, that, yeah, of course, yeah, definitely. That, the yeah. Medical stuff. I remember seeing the video with Mourinho and his physios when Harry Kane did his hamstring last season, and Mourinho comes out and goes, "We're yeah, fucked." Yeah. <laughs> like. It must be yeah. a big bit of pressure on the head physio to go to the manager yeah, and go, yeah. oh, this guy's out for X amount of time, long-term injury. Well, you could see he was uncomfortable yeah, yeah, doing that, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that leads us on just to say a massive yeah. thank you to you, Pat, for being our first yeah. guest. A hundred, hundred million yeah. thanks. For me and uh, Doughty, it's a, a bit more for us than Bates. Bates is Bates obviously a massive West Brom fan. We don't know loads about West Brom we've done obviously our research we know from around being in Prem and stuff like that um, it's a real yeah. eye, eye opener yeah. for us too as well so from me personally and obviously the other yeah. two as well thank massive you. thank you no problem pleasure yeah. really really appreciate it Pat thanks for uh, right. I only said an hour to you as well and I think we've nearly done well, we're, we're not shy off two are we so I, I do apologise one hour and forty so yeah yeah, um, so really, really do appreciate it. and I hope um, I know I've only ever met one of your kids Toby I hope Toby's alright I think he was yeah, awesome. He's a at the moment with the England under 19s. He's actually working as we speak at SGP. 
Oh, bloody hell. Fair play to him. Fair play. Fair play. Such a nice bloke, such a nice yeah. guy. Um, obviously, we, you, you, you took me down to Norwich that one day and we spent some time in the car. And I, I can only ever say good things about you as well. So I really do appreciate you coming on and, and, and giving us the insight into being a kit man for both professional club and obviously England. Um, yeah. So thank you ever so much for, for, for coming on. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers, good Pat. It's been good talking to you. Cheers. See you later. See you later. Bye bye. See you later, mate. Cheers.